So we're going to jump right in. Clap one more time for the worship team for being fantastic. We love you guys. I will drink to our worship team a throat coat. Okay. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Actually, you know what? I'm going to read John 3.16, and then we'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. John 3.16. Maybe you've never heard this scripture. Probably, in my opinion, the most famous verse in all of the Bible. It says this, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. God so loved the whole world. God loved Africa and Asia and the Middle East and even Canada people. I know it's hard to imagine. And shout out to the Canadians that are part of our ZST. It's not a shot that's fired at you. It's fired at your country. Anyways, but God loved the whole world so much that he gave his very best. He gave his one and his only son that if anybody chooses, remember having faith is a decision. And if anybody believes in God, they will not perish. That's really talking about eternal damnation, or as we call it in our culture, hell. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Heaven is a decision. Everlasting life is a choice. And you can only get to heaven, not by works, not by do-goodisms, not by obeying the law, but only by faith and trusting in Jesus can you get to heaven? It is that simple. The Bible says literally in the book of Romans chapter 10 that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, then you're saved. You don't have to do anything more or anything less to be saved. So it starts with God loving humans so much that he gave his one and his only son that if anybody believes in him, they'll go to heaven. Now, I want you to take that as a framework and go down to 1 Corinthians 9. That's where I ask you to turn, 1 Corinthians 9. And this is a guy named Paul. Paul was once a Christian hater, and he got saved. He starts following Jesus, and he goes from actually killing Christians to saving people that are not Christians. And he actually has this big burden, this big heart for people that are not of faith. And he actually goes on mission. Like he lives just a mission life of saying, my life doesn't mean anything to me. I know this world is not my home. All I want to do is serve people. All I want to do is win people over to Jesus. So he literally went from killing Christians to converting people to become Christians. And so watch the spirit and the attitude of the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says this, though I am free, Belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many people as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Verse 21, to those not having the law, I became like One, not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. Verse 22, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. In the last verse 22, uh, I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. So Paul is saying, listen, when I'm around law people, I become like them. When I'm around weak people, I become like them. When I'm around people that are not under the law, I become like them. I become all things to all people only so that I can win them, not to me, but to God. The spirit and the attitude of help I work with people is not saying, help. Uh, I work with people. Uh, help. I'm on customer service on AT&T for one hour. Help, I'm flying on American Airlines again. Help, I have neighbors that want me to be quiet. It's not help, I work with people, it's help. I work with people. And I want to be good at leading them somewhere. I want to be good at influencing them to Christ. I don't want to win them and convert them just to sales. I want to convert them into my Savior. 
I want to be calm. I love the spirit and the attitude. He, Paul the Apostle is not going like, man, law people are so hard. Weak people are so difficult. Man, free people, oh, they frustrate me. He's saying, no, I want to be fluid and I want to adapt and I actually want to win with others. Listen, I want to just remind you, you can't work with people that don't like you. Life starts with being winsome. We call this the favor of God. The favor of God. God's favor is on your family. God's favor is on your life. And you are favored, not just for your sales, not just for your church, but to win people to Christ. I wrote this book uh, a couple years ago. I was preaching in Oklahoma City. And uh, I was preaching at a, at a great church there. And, and, um, and while I was there, Pastor Craig Groeschel, who is just a hero in the faith to me and a hero in leadership, he has the largest church in America. Over 100,000 people attend his church physically on the weekends. And so he sent me a message. He said, hey, I see you're in my city. Could you have lunch tomorrow? And I'm like, I get like really nervous. I'm like, oh, the king has requested my presence. I'm like, yes, Pastor Craig, sir. And so I go in, I'm like really nervous and like, like I shave and stuff, you know, like I go into his office and, and I meet with Pastor Craig and like, I'm there to ask questions. He is the ultimate. He's, and he's got muscles and stuff. I, I've never had those. He's, he just, he's, he's got, you know, the church and the bod and just the, you know, he's just the man, you know, he looks like Tom Cruise for Christ. It's unbelievable. And, um, and so I go into his office and I'm ready to ask him all these questions and he's asking me questions. I'm like, Pastor Craig, this is not how it works. You're the largest church in the history of America. You're the man. I'm here to ask. And he's like, no, he's asking me questions. And he said, hey, have you thought about writing your first leadership book yet? And I'm like, again, I don't have muscles. I don't have, you know, we're just a few years into our church plant in Los Angeles. I know I, the answer to that is no, sir. I have not. And he looked at me. It was one of those divine moments. He said, you know, I think you need to start a leadership podcast and you should write a leadership book. I went back home and I thought about that and I really felt God speak to me that I was supposed to do those two things. So I started a leadership podcast called Leadership Lean In where I'd interview and talk to people about the subject and I started to write a leadership book. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to write a book on leadership, I want to write it in the, in the thesis or the heart of what I think leadership is about. Leadership is all about serving others. Leadership is all about adding value to others. Leadership is about equipping and inspiring. Leadership is never about self. It is always about others. So I said, if I'm going to write a leadership book, I'm going to write it about people. People are my favorite subject. People are my favorite thing about life. People, I believe they make a place. You're only as good as the people that you're with. It's not about where the bus is going. It's about who's on the bus. Just all about people. You got to understand, I grew up on a small island in the state of Washington. I grew up on Whidbey Island, one of the San Juan Islands. Grew up in an amazing family. In fact, my little sister has an amazing church in San Diego. My brother has a church in Seattle. And we were raised by incredible parents. Like, I respect and admire my mom and dad. By the way, today is my mom's birthday. Shout out to me, mama. Stella Flores. Sayama now, Vich. Um, but I grew up, my mom, uh, she was a high school Spanish teacher at the high school I went to. My dad pastored an amazing church. And my house in Oak Harbor, Washington was filled with people all the time. Like my house was that house where me and all my friends, we came on Friday nights and my sister and all her friends were there. And then my parents always had friends. And we just grew up in a house where like people were always in my house. Like I don't have a Thanksgiving or a Christmas memory with just our family. It's like all these strays were always in our home. It's like Merry Christmas. Um, what's your name again? Yeah, it's, oh, Ted. Great to see you, Ted. Hey, can I get some more eggnog when you get a chance? Great. But just like people were in our home, pastors were in our home. And I grew up under parents that I could tell respected everyone, valued others, treated people with kindness. In, in fact, in our, in our city, on our island, it was a naval air station. So about every two years, 
the high school changed. About every two years, a whole church changed. I just watched my parents collect friends, collect people, and uh, establish and value relationships. And I learned, I didn't realize through osmosis, I was inheriting the value of others, respecting people. And I didn't realize this, but I caught from my parents and the apostle Paul this desire. When I'm around these people, I want to win with them. When I'm around these people, I want to win with them. And I want, want, don't want to win people to my agenda. I want to win people ultimately to following Jesus and becoming committed followers of the love of God. So I wrote the heart and the spirit and the attitude of help. I work with people to so more like, you know, help. I work with people and I want to get good with influence. I want to get good at leadership. By the way, the definition definition of leadership, maybe like, I'm not a leader, man. Why are we going through this on a Sunday? No, no, no. Leadership by definition is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. And you have influence. I want to, I want to convince you, you have influence. They say the average person will influence, the average person will influence 70,000 people in their lifetime. That's the average person. So you're influencing people. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom and you're getting ready to start school tomorrow. You're influencing those little nuggets. We call them little nuggets in our home. Maybe you're influencing your neighbors. You're influencing people. And we want to use our influence. We want to get good at influence. Not winning them to us, but ultimately winning them to the greatest product we could sell. And that is Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen if you are down to pivot and say, help, I work with people. In fact, I want to preach a message today. Write down the title. I love the title today. It's moving from people are my problem to people are my passion. I believe in our church, we are through this book and through this series, we are moving from people are my problem to people are my passion. Listen, I just, I need you to understand this. You cannot do life well if you're doing people wrong. If you want to do life really, really well, you got to do people really, really well. And so we are, we are moving from people are my problem to people are my passion. One of the things I love about Zoe, by the way, I don't know if you knew this, but next Sunday, Zoe turns five years old. Come on, clap in advance. Happy anniversary. I don't know, I don't know what you're getting us for our anniversary gift, but maybe the school supplies for somebody would be a great anniversary gift, okay? But next Sunday, and, and a McFlurry in Jesus' name. But, but, but anniversary Sunday, we are five years into this thing in L.A., and I recognize in this time, so many people have moved uh, from D Missouri to Wyoming to Tennessee to Georgia, Boise, Idaho. So many of our church, one out of every five people are moving away from major metropolitan areas like L.A. And if that financially is you and you had to move, we love you. Thank you for still being a part of our church. You're still a part of our ZST if you want to. Z Zoe just went national and global during the pandemic. But we are five years into, from the day we started on August 23rd at One Oak on Sunset Boulevard, people are our passion. This church is all about God and all about people. We love people because God loves people. And I just want to invite you, if you're new to our church, you just joined us during the pandemic, this is maybe you're new to Zoe, I want to let you know what Zoe is all about. We're all about Jesus and we're all about people. This is the heart of our church. So come on, let's pray because I believe God's going to move us. He's going to pivot us from people are my problem yeah. <laughs> to people are my passion come on let's pray Jesus we thank you thank you God for our church five years of faithfulness five years of unprecedented grace thank you God for being so good to Zoe we pray right now instill into us your heart for humans Thank you, God, that you loved the world so much that you gave your one and your only son that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish. We want to take on that truth and the spirit of the Apostle Paul. We want to become all things to all people so we can win with them. Help every person that's streaming in to win at home, to win in their workplace, and to win in the world. God, we thank you that we will bring the message of the gospel to anyone and everyone that's willing to hear. And God, we thank you that as the playoffs start Tuesday, the same day that Help I Work, my, Work With People launches, that God, you will let the Lakers go on to win the NBA championship. In Jesus' name, and everybody said together.
Come on, clap right here in the ministry center and clap right there, wherever you're streaming in from. I just love this. I'm going to give you three things to write down today. Write down number one. I love this. God's in love with people. He's in love with people. Like, what does God really, really love? God loves humans. How much? He loves people so much that he sent Jesus. Watch this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, I love this in John 15. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. God God loves people. He's in love with people. He's obsessed with people. You might be like, what kind of people? People from every tribe, people of every tongue, every ethnicity, every socioeconomic background. It's amazing. Right now, you know, because of the book, we're talking to podcasts and talking to different people about the book, and people try and peg Zoe. They're like, okay, so, you know, Zoe's a young church. I'm, just, I'm like shaking my head. I'm like, uh, no, no, we're not. We're not a young church. So, like, when you came to L.A., um, your mission was to reach young people. I'm like, nope, nope. I, uh, quite, quite the opposite. Nope. Mm-mm. Uh-uh. When we came to L.A., we wanted to reach all of L.A. Like, I, I always think church should look like Dodger Stadium with the Dodger dog. We need to have, when we get back to in-person church, we need to start having Dodger dogs at church. Revival's finna break out. I'm telling you that right now. But, but, but when you go to Staples Center or you go to Dodger Stadium, you walk in and you can't tell if it's like there's a lot of Asians or there's a lot of Mexicans, there's a lot of black people or white. It's just L.A. It is a melting pot. You can't go to a Dodger Stadium or Staples Center and be like, oh, there's a lot of young people here or there's a lot of old people. It's just there's a lot of L.A. God does not love a certain type of person. God doesn't love religious people. God loves lost people. He loves broken people. He loves good people. He loves bad people. God doesn't change his love for your life based upon your behavior. It is called an unconditional love. It is called a love that will never cease. You can fail God. God won't fail you. You can turn your back on God. He will not turn his back on you. He is in love with humans. That's why he serves them. He gives to them and he chases them down. Oh, I love this in the Old Testament. There's a story about this guy named Hosea. And and, and his wife has gone off and done a bunch of bad stuff, left him and is going out sleeping around. And God speaks to this guy. And he's like, I actually, even though your wife's a prostitute right now and she's sleeping around, I want you to go buy her back. This guy's like, "Um, are you crazy? Like she slept with somebody, actually multiple people. There is no way that I'm going to go in. God's like, no, I want you to love her with the kind of love that I have for my people. Watch what it says here in Hosea chapter 3. I love this verse. Love her in the way I, God, love the Israelite people, even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. Listen, when you are flirting with other things that are for your demise and your detriment, God says, I'm still going to love you. When you are in kind of all all kinds of activity that lead to the death of sin God says I love you he doesn't turn his back he doesn't change God loves not just Christians or people that are in church he loves people that are away from God he loves people that are in sin he loves addicts he loves anybody thankful today that God loves you in your worst God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners he died for us God loves people His greatest passion is people. Why do we love people? Because God loves people. The first thing you got to understand about God is that God loves people. God loves, most of us, we think that behavior determines his love. If you behave right, I love you more. This is cause and effect Christianity and will lead to a terrible thinking in your life. If I act this way, God loves me more. No, that God cannot love you any more than he does right now. You could be sitting right now watching this message in the worst place of your life. I remember years ago he- hearing the incredible Ralt Reese story. If you guys don't know who Pastor Ralt Reese is, he's over in Diamond Bar, pastors an amazing church called Calvary Chapel, and he tells an insane story where he's literally drunk. Came, he was a drunkard. He was abusing his wife and his family and just a terrible place, messed up, broken person. He comes back home drunk one night, and he's there. He's drinking. He's c- c- contemplating suicide. 
And all of a sudden, as he flips on his television screen, there's a preacher preaching the gospel. Kind of like in today's generation, there's preachers on YouTube. He flips on YouTube. He flips on TV, and there's a preacher talking about the love of God, that God loves people right where they are, that the gospel is good news for broken, messed up people. And right there in his home, while he's drunk, he surrenders his life to the love of Jesus, and he turns his life around because that is the goodness and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God loves people. God loves people. God loves people. God's about people. God's all about people. In fact, the Bible says that if you love God and you hate people, you've never seen God. Because when you see God, you see his heart for humanity. He loves people. He died for people. He sent his son for people. Jesus went to the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. People are the passion of heaven. What is on God's radar is not a bunch of buildings. It's a bunch of people. He cares about people in the midst of pandemics. He cares about people in the midst of protests. He cares about humans. And when you receive the gospel and the good news of Jesus, he bends the arrow of your heart out. Remember, before Christ, all the arrows of your heart are in. Me, mine, me, me, me. You become a me monster. Everything about life is narcissism and self. We talk about it in the book. But when God gets a hold of you, he bends the arrows of your heart out to say, how can I serve and love? people the first thing you got to know about God is that God is in love with humans he's in love with humans that have money and humans that don't have money people that have stuff and don't have stuff he's in love with people that are really really good and he's in love still with people that are really really bad and the love of God is the greatest force on the earth the love of God will change the world and so you need to know this, that God loves people. And write down number two, he chooses relationship over everything. Like he loves people, but he doesn't just go around going like, look at all the people. Wow, they're awesome. Look at all, yeah, like I'm really into the new Aladdin. Like the old Aladdin's cool, it's cartoon. But the new Aladdin's awesome. It's got Will Smith, people. It's awesome. And it's like, it's just, it's cool because it's not cartoon. It's like, you know, you see Jazz, Yasmin, you know, she's like there in her palace and looks out over the people in her kingdom. God doesn't look down at the people like, oh, there's the people. No, he actually wants relationship with his people. He's not a distant God. He's not an away God. That's like, you're the people and I'm the king. He's a relational God. He doesn't treat you as a servant. He treats you as a friend. He said, no, no, a master treats a servant a certain way. I don't call you a, 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 a slave that way. I call you a friend. You're a friend of God. Oh, I love this about God. He boils all the commandments into two. He says this in Matthew 22. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Listen, in other words, what the Bible is saying is there's only two Two commandments in this new era. In the message of Jesus, there is only two commandments. That we love God and we love people. Another way you could say that. We have a relationship with God and we have a relationship with others. Relationship over everything. In other words, God's not like, you know what really gets me excited is when you come to church, you stream in, or when you tithe. No, no, God is not into your activity as much as he is into your relationship. He is a relationally driven God. And that, that's why I'm so grateful I grew up with my family. I'm so grateful I grew up with my parents because they modeled for me relationship over everything. Listen, when you get this in your heart, your greatest successes will be relational successes and your greatest failures will be relational failures. When you understand that relationship is over everything, then you'll say, you know what? My greatest accomplishments in life are my relationships and my greatest failures in life are relationships that failed. Have you ever had a relationship go south? You ever had a relationship that failed? And I'll tell you, maybe if you don't, you know, get a promotion or get a raise or maybe you fail at a book. Go, oh God, please no. Uh, maybe you, you know, you... This is my prayer. Did it slip out? Anyways. <laughs> Your greatest failures are not like money failures. Your greatest failures are not even moral failures. Your greatest failures are relationship failures. 
And your greatest successes are relationship successes. Because it's relationship over everything. The next time you're in conflict, choose the relationship over the battle. So you know what? We're in a fight right now. And the fight does not matter to me as much as the relationship matters to me. I could be right and win the battle. But if it means I got to lose the relationship, it's not worth it. Your relationships matter most because God said the two things that matter to me the most. My two commandments. I have boiled all the law and all the prophets and I have summed it up in this. Here's the only thing I want. I want you to have a relationship with me. And by, my, by the way, my relationship with you, I don't want it to be passive. I don't want it to be like kind of like, oh, I kind of follow God. He said, I want you to have a relationship with me with all your heart, all your strength, and all your mind. So I want to pass passionate relationship. I want you to have a relationship vertically and I want you to have great relationships horizontally. I love this because religious people are like, spell it out. What does that look like? Give me an example. Religious people are like, Jesus, you don't make sense right now. Who is my neighbor? If it's like, love my neighbor as myself. If this is the, what who, when, where, who's my neighbor? She's like, all right, you guys are really difficult to work with, but help, I work with people. <laughs> help, I work with religious people. Jesus goes, uh, okay, check this out. There's this guy, he's going on this journey, and he gets robbed, and they, you know, they just like, they, they just beat him, and they just, they, they mess with him bad, and they leave him for dead by the side of the road. This one guy walks by, and he just is like, you know, we've all walked by, like people that are hurting on the side of the road. We're like, oh, I don't see you. And so the first guy walks by, and the second guy's like the same thing, like, oh, I don't have time today. And he goes by, and he said, this, this one guy, Samaritan, now notice he chooses the word Samaritan, because in this context, historically, the Samaritans were the worst of the worst, the lowest of the lowest and the scum of the scum. So he said, but a Samaritan walked by, sees the guy and says, listen, helps him up onto a horse, takes him to a hotel motel, Holiday Inn. That was just to make sure you're listening. Pays his bills, hires a doctor on an app to come to the hotel, pays all of his medical bills, pays for his hotel, gets him Postmates. I'm preaching now. restores and rehabilitates this man's life. And Jesus looks at this religious people that are like, help. And he goes, okay, who do you think was a good neighbor in this example? And they're like, oh, man. Yeah, 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 the, the, the Samaritan. And he looks at him and he goes, this is such a great line from Jesus. He goes, go and do likewise. Serve people and have relationships with others that look like this. I want you to be passionate about your relationship with me, and I want you to be passionate about others. See, God is trying to move you from people being your biggest problem to people being your biggest passion. Now you get up in the morning going, how can I serve? You, you, when you change this attitude, all of a sudden you're like, God, today, send me somebody on the side of the road. God, I just, today is a, whoo -hoo, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And God, I'm asking today, will you give me an opportunity to love somebody? Will you, you give me an opportunity to be your hands and your feet on this earth? Will you give me an opportunity? God, I'm just looking. I got some Venmo account money ready. I got some blessing ready. Come on, Zoe. Somebody thank God. He is moving you from problems to passion. He wants you to say, help. I work with people, broken people, messed up people, away from God people. If you just love people that love you, what good is that? God wants you to love people that don't know your name. God wants you to love people that are around the world. God wants you to love people in your home and in your workplace and in our church. Somebody give them a praise on your couch and in your kitchen. We're moving from problems to passion. I get fired up about this because you need to know this. God is passionate about people, and he says relationship over everything. I want you to be a relational person, high relational. You might be like, well, on the Enneagram, I'm like a four. On the Enneagram, I'm a one. I'm an eight. I don't care about your Enneagram. It doesn't move God's desire in your life for you to be a people person. 
Maybe you're not outgoing. Maybe you don't have an extroverted personality. Drew, I love so much, leads our worship. Drew's always like, I'm the introvert. Yeah, but when I'm around Drew, I can sense he loves people. He loves our worship team. He loves everybody and the, all the musicians. He exudes out of his life. It exudes from him and Taylor. It doesn't matter if you're an extrovert or an introvert. It matters the condition of your heart. God's obsessed with people. He loves humans. People that you hate, God loves. And he says, what matters to me is not that I'm a king looking down at people. It's that I pursue them and I get a relationship with them. Relationship over everything. And he actually says, when you do this, when you love people, and when you value relationships, you move my heart. Right down the third and the last thing today, I love this. Worship team, you can start to play, or at least the keyboard player. We're going to land right here. When we value what he values, it moves his heart. Matthew 25, watch as it reads on the screen. Then the king will turn to those on the right and say, you have a special place in my father's heart. Now, just to give you some context for this, God has just divided on the right and the left, the Bible says, some sheep and some wolves. He says that he looks at the sheep, he looks at those that did the right thing, and he says, you have a special place in my Father's heart. Come and experience the full inheritance of the kingdom realm that has been destined for you from the foundation of the world. For when you saw me me hungry, you fed me. When you found me thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I had no place to stay, you invited me in, and when I was poorly clothed, you covered me. When I was sick, you tenderly cared for me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. The story goes on. And as Jesus says this, the crowd in his right looks at him and they're like, oh, God, that's really cool. But man, when did we see you hungry? And when were you ever naked without clothes? When were you, Jesus, when were you in prison? And he looks at this crowd and he says, remember what you did to the least of these you did to me. You got a special place in my father's heart. God cannot love you any more than he already does. Your behavior will not change his love, but your behavior will change whether God is pleased with you or not. So you have the opportunity to always be loved, but you have the opportunity to move into being pleasers of the heart of God. And when you love people, God says, that's it. When you treat people like the good Samaritan did, God says, that's it. When you love people that don't look like you, act like you, vote like you, dress like you, have money like you, it moves the heart of God. If you just love people that look like you and act like you and vote like you and dress like you, the Bible literally says, what good is that? The world does that and they don't even have the love of God. But when you receive the supernatural love of God, it gives you a supernatural love for others. You say, before I received the love of Christ, I was hard-hearted towards them. I was prejudice towards them. I was opinionated towards them, but God changed my heart. And now I, I want to visit people in prison. I want to feed those that don't have clothes. I want to give food to those that are hungry. That's why I love Zoe Cares. It's like we're giving away the gospel and groceries every Monday and Wednesday. Why? We're just trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're just saying God loves people, so why can't we give people some groceries? That's why you got to buy a back-to-school pack and give school supplies. Why? We're just trying to love people. We're just trying to be the hands and feet of Jesus to say people are our problem. People are our passion. When you operate in this, all of a sudden, sudden something changes in you. And God starts going, you treat people like that and you will please the heart of God. Zoe, we're turning five years old. And I want to tell you for five years, I feel God saying, I'm proud of you. Not for how many people attend, not for how many people are in a connect group, but for how many people you've served. You serve people locally. You serve people nationally. You serve people globally. And you've cared for people the way that I care for them. You love people like I love people. You've bridged relationships the way that I would bridge relationships. Remember, people couldn't understand Jesus. 
they trip out. He'd be around restaurants. He'd be at cl- clubs. He'd be at different places. They'd be like, Jesus, why are you hanging out with them? Why do you eat with them? And they would call Jesus a drunkard. They would call Jesus a glutton. They couldn't understand why he was hanging out with people that weren't in the temple. Jesus said, I'll tell you why. Because people matter most to God. And I'm here to bring relationship to people that never thought they had a chance to be in relationship. And I'm here to please God. I'm not here to please man. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please God. Somebody thank him right now. We're moving from problems to passion. From burden to blessing. Come on, we are going to go out and we are going to be a church that says, help, I work with people. I want to get good at influence. I want to get good at leadership. I want to get good at people skills. Jesus was a master at people skills. The world will come and listen to him because he loved them. I do not want to build a church that we just stay in our comfortable, convenient Christianity. And we come together and we are just, you know, we're the good people and they're the bad people. No, I want to build a church that says we love people, we love relationship, and we love serving and adding value to others. And I believe that when we do this and we step into this, I believe we please the heart of God. We will not, listen, God will love Zoe no matter what we do. God will love you no matter what you do. You can't change the love of God. It's an unconditional love. So if you're like, is God going to love me more? No, God can't love you more. But he will be pleased with your passion for people. He will be moved by your love for relationship. And when you do that, I think he's going to set up divine appointments. I think he's going to give you opportunities to love somebody, heal somebody add value to somebody, rehabilitate somebody, resurrect somebody, release somebody. Life is about people. Life is about relationship. God is about people and God is about relationship. I can't encourage you enough. He's trying to pivot us and maybe you've been stuck. Maybe you've been angry. Maybe you're mad at somebody in your house. Maybe you're mad at somebody in your family. Maybe you're just like, oh, help. I work wrong. The only way that God can work in your life is by you first receiving his love, receiving his heart for others. It doesn't start by doing. It always starts by receiving. I want to pray for you today that you would pivot from people are my problem to people are my passion. That you'd leave this service today going, you know what? God loves people. Forgive me, God because I have only loved a select few. And God, open up my eyes, expand my heart to love humans. God, forgive me, I've been more into religion than relationship, and I just, I wanna be relationally driven. I wanna value my relationships above everything else. Don't choose that business deal, choose the relationship. Don't choose that conflict, choose the relationship. Relationship, listen, some of you, some of you, when I said it, it was like something went off in you. Your biggest failure is a relationship, but your biggest success will be relationships. Relationship with children, relationship with parents, relationship with church, come on, it's relationships. And I believe we're about to step into pleasing the heart of God. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for our church. I thank you so much for people streaming in. I ask that right now you would let people be our passion. God, remove the brokenness. Remove the walls. Remove the hurt. God, remove our obstacles of loving others. We ask right now. God, let us pivot. Lord, we we just move into passion. Passion. Lift a hand in your home right now. God, I pray and I I just, I, I declare an impartation. I pray that 1 Corinthians 9, that we will become all things to all people so we can win with them. I pray that right now in Jesus' name. You can put your hand down if you've never said yes 